Aloha mai kako. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for episode five of Aola Mau Amau. We look forward to starting this presentation soon. Um, we're going to wait a few moments to let people into the room from the waiting room and make sure that all of our guests are our guest panelists are lined up again mahalo for joining us and where are you joining us from can you tell us what island or where you're calling in from. Great oh aloha all right we'll be starting in just a few moments. Aloha mai kako, and thank you for joining us this afternoon and welcome from Papa Olalokahi, the Native Hawaiian Health Board. This webinar this afternoon is being recorded and it's being live streamed across many of our partner platforms on Facebook. Uh, as we go through the presentations, we've got two separate reports that will be reported on today. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A panel at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you are watching on Facebook, you put them in the comment section and we will find them and make sure that our presenters get the questions. An evaluation will be sent to your email automatically upon close uh, when you depart the webinar. We appreciate your comments, your simple feedback, so that we know how to improve our programming. My name is Kim Kuule Bernie. I'm with Papa Ololokahi, and we're very pleased to bring you episode five of the Aola Mau Amau Report Back to the Community series. The Aola Mau Report is the landmark Hawaiian Health Needs Assessment that was published in 1985, which provided the data and information needed to uh, really make the case to address the disparities among Native Hawaiians for health through legislation and allocation of resources. A Hawaiian health status has been updated, updated many times since 1985, both at Papa'ola Lokahi, like every year, every other year, and also by the Department of Native Hawaiian Health at the U University of Hawaii Manoa, John A. Burns School of Medicine. Our most recent comprehensive assessment, Aola Mau Amau, came out just before the pandemic. So the findings are somewhat recent. Uh, but the environment has certainly shifted and we're going to ask the panelists about that as well. This report to the community series shares the findings and recommendations from each of the chapters and allows the presenting authors to reflect on what might have changed in the past two years. Episode five today highlights two separate reports nutrition and food systems, and also oral health conditions among Native Hawaiians. Our three presenters, and I'm hoping that our uh, presenter emeritus joins us real soon. Uh, uh, I'll work on that with you, Jody. Uh, our three presenters today are Dr. Claire Hughes, Dr. Jody Leslie, and Dr. Emmy Eno Orikasa. I'm going to start out by introducing the panelists for the nutrition and food systems. And then in the second hour, we'll introduce Dr. Eno Orikasa separately. All right. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, Claire, who's not here to, 
yet, but she will be soon. Claire Kuule Lenny Hughes was born in Kalia in Waikiki, raised in Keikaha, Kauai, and Honolulu. She graduated from the Kamehameha School for Girls, earned a Bachelor of Science from Oregon State in 1958, did a completed a dietetic internship at the Alameda County Hospitals in California in 1959, and became the first Hawaiian registered dietitian with the American Dietetic Association. In 1969, she completed a master's degree at, at the University School of Public Health and became the first Hawaiian public health nutritionist. And in 1998, Claire became the first nutritionist to earn a doctorate of public health. Initially, Dr. Hughes worked in school food services and as a part-time dietitian at the Kaiser Hospital in Waikiki. After earning her master's degree, she embarked on a career in public service that lasted nearly 34 years as the public health nutritionist with the Department of Health and the manager of the Office of Health Equity. Dr. Hughes mentored the next generation of Hawaiian nutritionists and dietitian to, including her co-presenter today. In fact, she mentored many of us in the Hawaiian health arena as we all navigated the national minority health movement. Her most defining nutrition role was working with Drs. Kekuni Blaisdell and Noah Emmett Aluli on the Molokai Diet Study, which set nutrition standards for the traditional Hawaiian diet and all the subsequent uh, traditional Hawaiian diets that were developed after that. And um, there's more here, but I'm going to tell you, she's retired now. Since retirement in 2003, Dr. Hughes has remained active on numerous boards and committees to improve the health of Native Hawaiians. Beginning in 1995 and following Dr. Blaisdell, I might add, Claire contributed a monthly column on Hawaiian health and well-being traditions to OHA's newspaper, Kawaiola, reminding the community of many aspects of Hawaiian culture, values, and traditions that promote and assure good health. Her co-presenter is Jody Haunani Leslie, born and raised in Kona, Hawaii. Dr. Leslie is a Native Hawaiian registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator with training in integrative and functional nutrition. She earned her degrees in food science and human nutrition and maternal and child health and public health nutrition at the University of Hawaii. And her doctorate in public health is in community-based and transitional research. She shares a private practice in West Hawaii, providing comprehensive health care for their community, learning that disproportionate burden of disease that existed among Native Hawaiians and drawing from their own life experiences. Um, Dr. Leslie and, doc and her partner, Dr. Matsuo, later understood the need for culturally compassionate medical care that encompassed healing of the body mind, and spirit to restore lokahi, or balance in people's lives. Dr. Leslie Matsuo is an alumna of the Native Hawaiian Health Scholarship Program and a published researcher. In 2020, she took over the monthly column in Kavaiola that focuses on Hawaiian well-being. Without further delay, uh, I turn this platform over to you, Dr. Let Dr. Leslie. And um, Tersha, if you have the screen, we're looking at your email, and we'd love to see that PowerPoint presentation. Perfect. To you, Dr. Leslie. Right, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me, and thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, I, you know, I was uh, very fortunate to be able to work with and train with Dr. Hughes as a student, you know, from, from when I was a student, you know, until currently, she continues to mentor me and train me. So it's just an honor to be able to work with her and, and um, um, help support uh, her and her endeavors or uh, support each other, I guess you could say. <laughs> um, okay, so, you know, we were, we were plan we plan to co-present um, this section together. And then so um, related to that, we had kind of divvied up the slides <laughs> and the parts, but you know what, I'm gonna try my best to, to um, go through her parts. And then when she's able to log on, then she, you know, I'm, I'm sure she'll, she'll contribute um, whatever, whatever I left out. So um, starting with, with increased understanding. Um, so since, 
the first Aola Mau report, which occurred in 1985, there were a number of, you know, the, the data and the information from that report sparked a lot of initiatives and policies that serve to support Native Hawaiian health. The Native Hawaiian Healthcare Act was one of them. And out of that act, um, we had, had gotten the Native Hawaiian healthcare systems, which um, we, uh, we have represented on each of the major islands, um, as well as Papa Ola Lokahi. And you know, those centers have just been remarkable in being able to serve the needs of Native Hawaiians and the community at large being a resource. Um, some, uh, I think many of the centers now have medical doctors on staff where they're able to see people there or take them to specialty appointments. So it's just, um, you know, those are just a couple of the wonderful examples that have come out um, you know um, that the uh, the original report had 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 sparked from to come out. So I just wanted to to mention that um, one of the things that um, had uh, one of the other things that had come out of the report was the burden of chronic disease among Native Hawaiians. And from 1985 until now, that burden has only increased. We just see growing rates of chronic disease uh, happening among our Native Hawaiians. Um, and if you compare Native Hawaiians to other major ethnic groups in Hawaii, uh, many of the, um, for, for many of them, Hawaiians are in the number one or number two spot, you know, tied with maybe another ethnic group. So they continue to suffer from, from many different chronic diseases. Um, poor nutrition. In 2017, there was a report that had come out from, from, from University of Washington that recognizes poor nutrition being um, the, the, uh, the number one cause for these growing rates of chronic disease periods. So it actually overtook tobacco as being the number one cause. And then when you look at the six leading causes of death in the US and in Hawaii, which mirrors um, the, um, the same um, reasons for the deaths, um, six out of the 10 were, re were considered diet related. So diet has, um, uh, diet and nutrition is a major part of what we're seeing with our Native Hawaiians and what we feel that, you know, is something that through many factors has been something that, that we can help, you know, uh, you know uh, all of us that read this report and work together towards helping the betterment of the Hawaiians. Um, let's see, I'm just making sure I, 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 I didn't miss anything. Okay. Um, another thing that has, has uh, drove, you know, besides, you know, the diet itself is one thing and, you know, just working for those of us who work in healthcare, you know, that it's just not enough to tell Hawaiians or to tell our people, to tell the community that they have to eat healthy, they have to eat more fruits and more vegetables. There's so many other things that come into play. Um, one of the things is increased urbanization, which we see particularly on, you know, in Oahu and, you know, in certain pockets of some of the other islands that have made owning property challenging, having property challenging, having the space to grow your own fruits and vegetables. Um, so um, that has become an issue, the cost of living, which has required people to work multiple jobs where they don't have the time to maybe make home cooked meals. Um, those are, and, and uh, the cost of living just in general, well now, you know, we have the cost of gas. And you know, so, so just the cost of living, the cost of everything just makes it difficult to buy healthy foods. And then, so there's more reliance on imported foods, which tend to be cheaper, but also tend to be, um, you know, depending on what you get, I guess, tends to not always be the most healthy. And then if we're talking about traditional foods, going back to our traditional foods, that of course is, you know, has become more expensive over the, the years. And so that becomes um, more, ch uh, more challenging to purchase. Some other things that have, um, uh, just briefly that have contributed to that, you know, just with, with technology and the advances, you know, that has kind of phased out um, physical activity that used to be a part of the daily life. So, you know, there are so many things happening right now in society that just um, puts everything against us when it comes to making healthier choices. Um, in, in, ter in terms of effective and promising approaches. So, you know, 
uh, there has been since 1985, there has been a number of programs that have helped and have been shown to help Native Hawaiians improve their health. One of the main ones, which, which I wish Dr. Hughes was here to talk more about, was the beginning of the traditional Hawaiian diet programs. So um, the roots for that, I, I believe, came out of Molokai. And they expanded, they expanded to Waianae and then, you know, to other communities where, where, they, um, where they offer the program. And these are 21 day programs where they offer them traditional foods, but also local foods that were comparable to these traditional foods. Um, and, you know, uh, the people who joined these programs were able to eat as much as they wanted to, and they still experienced success in losing weight, lowering their cholesterol and lowering their blood pressure. And you know what, I see Dr. Hughes just logged on. So I want to give her a chance to speak a little bit more about it. So I'm gonna, if you don't mind, Dr. Hughes, I'm going to turn it over to you at this part. So we're talking about traditional Hawaiian diets, uh, the programs. Aloha, okay. Claire. I'm going to ask you to okay. unmute. Yes, there I got you it. Go. I got Perfect. it. Perfect. All right. Welcome. I we we did your bio. I must be excited, you guys. I'm sorry. But the first diet took place on Molokai with Dr. Emmett Aluli and um, Dr. Blaisdell at the helm. And what they were doing was trying to find out how diet affected the deaths of people on Molokai, which had just happened from cardiovascular diseases, several different kinds. And so the Hawaiians that were selected were not allowed to lose weight, but they were to stay on the Hawaiian diet for three weeks, no, no outside food. So they came to a common uh, site, they all ate together, and the foods were measured and given them, and they had to eat exactly what was given them to maintain their weight. And it was difficult. Um, there were people who had to eat a little bit more than others. So they, everyone stayed at the table while the last people ate and we would talk. And that gave us time to do education, uh, health education. And it was great fun, but you saw the ability to stick on to this thing. They tried some to deviate and their families would tell them no. One person went to the store and the person at the store told him, who was not Hawaiian, hey, you're on the diet. So everybody backed them up. And it was um, a way that we saw the whole community come behind this effort. But what the Hawaiians who participated did was to show us how much being a Hawaiian and participating in something that was exclusively Hawaiian uh, meant what it meant to them. And so our other um, educational opportunities with the diet that went around the islands, people had problems, they didn't tell us, but they would go to the doctors and check afterwards and the doctors were thrilled. We had a school-based one here at, at Kaimaki and the man came to me and he said, my doctor wants me to go on your diet all the time because this is the first time I didn't have problems when I went to see him. So um, it was, it worked with different people, but all because they knew they were Hawaiian, they didn't cheat on the diet, they stayed on it. So this has a deeper meaning than just losing weight or modifying a health condition. It really has a very deep cultural base. And I think that's one of the reasons it's so important. So um, um, then uh, the, we need more educational training, though, opportunities for this. And we need more um, food systems that will support our diet program because we don't have Hawaiian food that's available enough for everybody. Uh, we have to um, pay so much money for poi now. Luau is not as available as it used to be. And so um, we need to have more um, programs that help our farmers. And I've asked, I've asked for um, the governor twice, straight on. And he said, sorry, he doesn't have money. But um, I'm going to uh, encourage everyone to get behind some of the um, community efforts that come about to get uh, support for our taro farmers, especially. That's a, 
they work eight hours and then they come home and tend to tarot. And it's um, life, uh, it, it, it includes everything they can do every day of their lives. It's, it fills their life. They don't have time for anything else. So we really need to um, uh, get some more funding for them, support for them. Okay. That's something that that um, uh, Dr. Hughes and I also talked about yesterday was that how you know there's also so much, so many other programs that are going on. Like Kaala Farms has been someone that historically has has worked with us in helping to to educate the keiki and getting them to learn more about different techniques. And there are a number of other farms. I think Mao Farms is is, is another one. Um, there are these. Um, uh, fish pond restoration projects that is going on, you know, and then and and we also have, I think UH West Oahu has developed a program, a degree in sustainable and community food systems. And that's just a few of many examples of different educational and training opportunities that help provide the knowledge and and, and skill that 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 uh, can help to support health. And one one other thing, if you are a nutritionist or if you are a farmer, um, reach out and, and ask people to help because I think there are many Hawaiians who would like to help and would like to um, assist in other ways. Uh, in other ways, maybe they can't come and do the tarot thing for with you in the low E, like myself, too old, but uh, we can do other things to help. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, as the first bullet says here, despite the past 30 years of sincere effort, Native Hawaiians can use, continue to experience increasing prevalence of chronic disease and premature death from health conditions that are treatable and preventable. You know, um, when we're talking about specific diseases, Hawaiians, so in terms of overweight and obesity, 75.7% of Native Hawaiians in Hawaii are considered overweight and obese. So that's three out of every four Hawaiians. So that is considered an issue. You know, they're number one for heart attack, number one for kidney disease, number one for a depressive disorder. Um, so they, you know, they, they are they are at the top of a lot of these diseases. So, and then when we look at their habits, you know, they, you know, it, it's interesting because they are eating more fruits and they are eating more vegetables and they are engaging in more exercise compared to some of the other ethnic groups, but. They're drinking a lot of soda and a lot of sugar, which of course can contribute to, uh, to obesity. But also if we're talking about portions and quantities, which is not measured so readily in, in some of these surveys that are already ongoing, you know, then you know, that's another issue as well. Um, I also wanna point out a study, a 2019 study that was done where they looked at life expectancy. So life expectancy in Hawaii, so in Hawaii at large was, was 82.1 years. For Native Hawaiians, that was 79.4 years. And healthy life expectancy of Native Hawaiians was 62.6 years. So what that means is that the last 16.8 years of a Native Hawaiian's life is spent in disability, is spent where they're not feeling well, they're not able to have, they're basically not able to have quality of life and experience full independence um, from, from, you know, uh, their everyday living. And that's really significant when you think about it. That's a long amount of time to be having to spend, you know, suffering from these diseases and suffering from disability. So, you know, there is so much work that needs to be done that, that you know, collectively we can work on together. Um, uh, uh, Claire, do you want to touch up on maybe just the, you know, we we're talking about yesterday, the, the lack of nutrition and health programs that continue for the Native Hawaiians beyond like, say, the the traditional Hawaiian diet programs and just what's available in the community. Yes, I was saying that when I when I was a youngster, we had uh, extension programs with the University of Hawaii. Um, the University of Hawaii is a land grant college, which means that they have funding for special agricultural um, uh, 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 studies, and uh, they are to also help the community understand agricultural needs, and so. This nutrition outreach program was something that was um, really uh, came to fore, I think, in about uh, uh, the 1940s during World War II. We had a lot of people coming out because we were without food at that time, too. Yeah, it was 
um, our shipping was cut way down, like we're experiencing right now, just not ever, not even as bad as we had, had during World War II. But our shipping uh, was was down. So the University of Hawaii geared up with, with this um, agricultural programs and their 4-H. So all of us were taught how to sow and how to uh, market and how to um, cook foods. And um, I think this is a time when we need to have uh, a rebirth of these programs because we have new people in our community. Uh, it, uh, it's been a long time since the 1950s and 60s when we had these programs continued. And uh, we need to rebirth those programs to help the new generation. And uh, the ability is still there. The university still has the responsibility to do these things. We just need to um, encourage them to do it. And um, we have many programs for children so they, they can learn from early age to do the things that are needed to have better health and nutrition. We had um, both farming projects as a kid, as well as uh, sewing projects and other things that are help you be uh, to help you be a better um, housewife and mother. So those are um, programs I think we need to reinstill because they actually teach down at the one-on-one -on -one level. Uh, but we also can benefit from a number of new uh, age things. If we have people out there that have the means and the will, we could have uh, TV programs that teach cooking. Right now, I know that on the Home and Garden uh, program, uh, one of the ladies that was a builder of uh, or redecorator, Joad Gaines, is now teaching people to cook on her programs. And she's fun because she eats the food as she's cooking or she enjoys it. It's very down to earth. And it would be very good if we could have programs like that. Uh, here, we had a long running Hawaiian electric program when in the 40s, uh, 50s rather, 50s and 60s, they opened their showroom when they brought out new um, uh, refrigerators and freezers and ovens and stoves they would demonstrate how to use it. And they cooked things and uh, in downtown Honolulu, they would prepare food and uh, in front of an audience made up of us that came down from our jobs to the uh, event to see. So we learned new ways to cook and make things healthier. We need that kind of thing again. We are all relying far too much on our pre-prepared food um, some of that food is um, pretty good. Some of it is not at all good. But it, what happens is that food fills the, the ache in the stomach. And so we put food in there. Cost is a big factor. And if you learn how to cook at home, it's a lot less costly than if you, um, you know, uh, buy everything from the store fully made. And uh, even... Um, can add nutritional quality to things that are bought there. So if your family eats McDonald's dinner, but you come home and uh, you take it home and they eat it with a big salad, then that's good too. Yeah. So we can make it better. But we have to teach people. And then in regards to lack of research, you know, there, there really isn't a lot of research that done that provides insight into the diet and nutrition behaviors of Native Hawaiians. And that would be important to know, you know, if we had that. Also some type of monitoring done, um, I, you know, in, in you know, a, a, a subcategory under monitoring is, you know, there's so much other programs, there's so much people that are doing aina-based nutrition, diet-based programs in Hawaii, and but there's no clearinghouse in terms of what everybody is doing and, and somehow working to coordinate efforts so that we recognize that there is so much program going on, but we don't know who's doing what. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, the gaps. We all know that these uh, foods are not always available to us and accessible. And if they are there, sometimes they're not affordable. And um, so we tend to eat uh, other things instead. 
and uh, or um, we, if we can afford it, we treat it more like it's a luxury item and just put a little bit on our plates. So it's not really fair to the diner uh, to, you know, I, I, I love to eat poi and my family uh, brings me poi. And the neighbors, if they have extra poi, they'll give me poi because they know I love it and brought, was brought up on it. But it's not always that easy. And so, first of all, we can, like uh, Jody was saying, we can cook some of our own backyard uh, taro uh, plant um, farms uh, work. I have friends who have quite a number of um, carbs that they grow on a regular basis and families can eat that. But um, there is a shortage of our traditional foods and they are costly. And, and that's unfortunate, but um, we have to just encourage more of the subsidies for guard, uh, for farming that I want. I want uh, the depart, um, department of, um, uh, I can't think of the name right now, but one of our state departments to give um, subsidies to our farmers so they can get more land and more water and produce more farms. Yeah. And then um, another thing, oh, can you go back to the previous slide, please? Sorry, I'll, I'll be brief. So just also want to mention another gap we found was a severe shortage of primary care and other clinical providers on neighbor islands that limit access to health and nutrition information and instruction. So, you know, on the neighbor islands, you know, a lot of a lot of the, the clinics and the centers, they do not have registered dietitians. And, and you know, with, with, with just um, the shortage, the shortage of physicians on, on each of the islands, you know, there's, I mean, you, you get what you get. And then so their only their only contact with a health professional may be a primary care physician or a nurse or, or similar. And so, um, you know, that uh, and and even then it's it, it takes months often time for an appointment. So, you know, that that is the only line or the only way that they, they may they may have a or, or the resource, I should say, they have for health, health information. Um, food insecurity is an ongoing issue that is largely underestimated, we feel. And, you know, food insecurity is, is not only a lack of food, but it's lack of access to healthy food. And then so oftentimes we may see people who are overweight um, and, and, you know, or, and, and, and we think, oh, you know, they, uh, they have a lot of food. So you don't think of them as food insecure. But if we think of it, but if we also look at it as enough healthy food, and that may be a cause if, if they don't have enough money where all they can afford is ramen and canned meats and stuff like that, that, and they can't afford fruits and vegetables, then they're food insecure. You know, so, uh, you know, that, that, that's something that, that um, we need to consider when we're looking at the, uh, the issue of, of nutrition and diet. Okay. Next okay, can I, add, can I add that the university programs we can get if you call the university extension numbers and support us when we, um, when we talk about it too, support each other. But the training programs are available, should be available, and we can still access. That was a question from the community. So, and then there, there are also uh, programs for children from, um, for these 4-H programs. Okay, so um, now we can go to the side. Sorry. Okay, no, that's good. No problem. Okay, so recommendations. So related to what we said on the previous slide, training to and partnerships with physicians and staff to provide and institutionalize Native Hawaiian health and nutrition programs. Like we mentioned, there is not a lot of resources available. There's not a, health, a lot of healthcare providers available. And so given that these are the only resources that are in the community, um, if, if there's a way we can partner with them and provide training to them, uh, to the physicians, to the medical assistants, to the nurses, to all the people that are involved in the patient care and be able to recommend them to attend a nutrition class or, you know, someone gets newly diagnosed with diabetes, be able to, you know, refer them to somebody who can give them, you know, uh, some instruction on that. So that's, that's um, one of our, our main recommendations. And, you know, um, I know the issue has come up before that we need to train more students in the field of nutrition and dietetics. And that is in itself a good thing. But the reality of that is, and I can speak from personal experience, is that those positions are not available. Yeah. They're not available on the neighbor islands. And then so you can train a lot of them. But when they go back home, like I had the issue when I moved back home and I did not, I couldn't find a job. 
And so, um, you know, it, we need to be able to think broader and think of, of, of cross-training these other steps in nutrition and being able to make it a regular part of services. Um, the increased uh, funding for research, you know, um, we um, had talked about that briefly too in a previous slide, but we, you know, we, we need more funding, more opportunities for research and not only on Oahu. And you know, just being from a neighbor, I'm a strong advocate for being on the islands, but there is not a lot of time. When, whenever there's research that a native one community is often the neighbor islands get left out. Yes. And then so we need we need more research out there. And then likewise, we need to allow more researchers on the ground there and not have what they call helicopter researchers that fly in from Oahu, that go there, the community doesn't know them, they collect all their data and they fly right back home. You know, we need some people in the community that they can trust. And so that's really important to be able to expand the research base to allow research centers, smaller research on, on the on these islands. And um, what well, this last slide uh, we talked about yesterday, uh, a little bit, Joe, uh, Jody, this is the agency that I wanted. I couldn't remember the number uh, name earlier, the department DBED. Yes, D uh, DBED is um, the one that is the T is for tourism, economic development and tourism. Yeah. That is the one that has the strategic plan, which includes increased amount of local grown foods consumed by Hawaii residents. Now, Momi uh, is asking questions of how do we do it? This is one of the how to places, Momi. We need to contact them and let them know we're looking for places, for uh, farms for our kids. Uh, we need to let people there know that we want uh, more opportunities on neighbor islands for farms. We need to let call them and tell them you're looking for it. I, I can't remember the head of it uh, right now, but just start calling them. That's how other people get it, by nagging. And so we need to start to let people know, get to your representative at the legislature. I spoke with neighbor island legislators about getting food to neighbor islands that were, get it to you, refrigerate it all the way. And uh, the, it was too uh, up there, didn't want to discuss it. So it's, we have to keep trying and let them know that there are people and investigate some of the ways and means that that can be happy, happen too. If you want to make it happen, tell them what step one, step two, and who you could, they, could, they could call. But work with your legislators. They're the ones that get the, uh, can tell DBED they're not going to fund them unless they do stuff. So uh, your legislator is your God. <laughs> you need to go after him and tell him, pray to him, tell him, please help us. So really there's a lot of ways that you can get something you want by asking the government. Not many people do that. So just do it. Next slide, please. Okay, and then related to what we've been talking about all along, identifying employer strategies to recruit and retain physicians and clinical professionals on the neighbor islands. So there was discussion, I think, before with the, I think it was the White Primary Care Association and some other places about help with student loans. You know, the cost of living is so expensive and, you know, and the reimbursement rates are not ideal for 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 many for many of these doctors and I think just doctor, uh, primary care doctors in Hawaii so being able to help with student loans um, you know there was something in the news not too long ago about how Hawaii is the only state that doesn't offer GE tax exemptions for primary care doctors doctors in hospitals get that tax exemption but not primary care doctors in clinics um, being able to work with insurance perhaps and negotiate higher insurance reimbursements so that it makes it financially feasible where they can live in Hawaii and work and be able to work and serve the community, pay off their student loans and their obligations. And perhaps even a physician mentoring program that uh, where somebody checks in with these primary care doctors occasionally and be able to just check in and send how they're feeling, whether they're feeling burned out just by seeing a large number of patients because of the shortage by, you know, by not having enough money to pay their bills and all of that. So that's important. Um, increased funding for food assistance programs. So not only the food bank, but, you know, restaurants, community centers, churches that are offering um, meals program. And this was really, really um, helpful during the pandemic. You know, there were, there were COVID monies that were given to restaurants 
um, and given and given to to community groups that where they made hot meals for people and the lines were so long and people would come in and do it and you know so being able to continue that for you know especially in pockets of community that that may have a larger percentage of of, of low income people um, and then I'll let Claire talk about the subsidies uh, before I get into the last bullet. <laughs> Well, I wanted to, um, I want, I've already mentioned some of my efforts on sub, getting farmers subsidies, but I'm going to continue with it. But there was a question from one of the participants about uh, getting dietetic internships. You know, those internships take place at specific places, and they are limited in number wherever you go. So I, I chose to go one on, uh, to one on the mainland. And when I came home, um, my training didn't mean much because the girls that had remained here had all of their uh, time in the hospital. So they were well known to hospitals. So I got no hospital job. So there's some drawbacks, but what is really good is if you move out of your comfort area and get an internship on the mainland, you can learn many things that you don't learn in Hawaii. Like uh, we experienced going down and actually bidding for produce for the um, for the hospital. We we would not do that here, but they would go down to the shipping areas and uh, as the pr products came off, they would give a bid for so many cases of that and so many cases of the other of fresh, as well as some of the canned items. So you don't get that uh, experience here. So you have to have a um, probably scholarship. So uh, I'm not too sure um, uh, the uh, Native Hawaiian healthcare system does have some money for, or Papa Ola Lokahi does have some scholarship money that you can ap apply for, but I don't know uh, how much is available every year. It's different, yeah. So just keep applying, keep looking for money. Yeah, and, and I believe there are um, some opportunities that are available, available locally, like I think Sodexo was one of them, yes. uh, and I think there, there were a couple of them, but I know it's highly competitive, and that's what makes, and I think that's where the larger challenge is, yeah, it's just so competitive, um, but you know, what I had, uh, uh, I had some student helpers before, and you know, who were applying for internships, and I think what, you um, something that that we had discussed was being able to volunteer if you can volunteer for different places that looks better on your application for these intern uh, um, internships that you apply for so you know that that's always um, you know that's something that you consider so think of different places you, you can volunteer that can help build up your your resume <laughs> your experience resume um, Okay, and then just just um, to close out with with our our last bullet. So, develop and support policies that institute SSB tax. So, SSB taxes are sugar sweetened beverages taxes, and I don't know how many have heard of it, but they're basically taxes that different counties and different places have done, where they put you know like how they do a tobacco tax. So they 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 add a tax to soda and sports drinks, and you know. Uh, many of the popular um, high sugar drinks. And they use that extra tax to fund health programs. And then, so likewise, we could look at doing something similar, um, where if we instituted something like that, all these health programs that we're talking about and this training we're doing about and this nutrition uh, programs, you know, it could be, it, it could, you know, we could have some funding for it if we did that. Just just um, some really brief examples. So the Navajo Nation, um, they they did that on, on the reservation. They did a 2% tax on unhealthy foods, sugar sweetened beverage and sugar sweetened beverages. So this includes cookies, cakes, and candies, and like I mentioned, those beverages, and a waiver of 5% sales tax on healthy foods, water, fresh produce, and nuts. And since the tax was implemented, its gross revenue has been 7.58 million the gross revenue. Um, and the first year alone, it was close to 1.9 million. Um, so it has worked and other counties are, are doing it like in Colorado, in California, in Washington, and in um, Pennsylvania. So, you know, it's something that we can consider as a state. It, it, you know, we have a blueprint for it already. And if we're, you know, funding is always an issue. So if we're looking at the funding to, to carry out many of these recommendations, that's an idea. Okay, so um, that's it. I don't know, Claire, if you have anything to add, or I guess we'll just move on to the next.
present yeah, thank you both so much, Dr. Leslie, Dr. Hughes, and please stay with us because I want to be sure to um, give our oral health report some time as well, but I'm sure that there will be questions. I see questions on the side and coming in on the Facebook page that we want to pose to you. I want to talk to you more about the SSB tax, but um, right now, so to all who are attending today, please stay with us. I'm sure we're going to go past one o'clock, and I hope that's okay with all of you. It's okay okay with us because we want to be sure to hear the good work of the oral health report and all of the authors of that report and um, give you all an opportunity to ask our presenters today any questions that you might have. So as we move on to the oral health report and stay with us, Dr. Leslie and Dr. Hughes, mahalo nui for your presentation. Um, Dr. Emmy Malia Eno Orikasa was born in Southern California and raised on Maui. She's a graduate of Baldwin High School. From a young age, dentistry had always been her career goal. She obtained both her Bachelor of Science and Doctor of Dental Surgery degrees from the University of the Pacific. Upon graduating from dental school, she returned returned home to Maui to practice with her uncle in upcountry Maui. After almost 10 years in private practice, Dr. Eno Orikasa joined Hui no Keolopono, the native Hawaiian healthcare system that serves the island of Maui. Uh, as the oral health director, she values the whole health concept that the Hui fosters, which allows clients to not only address their or oral health, but also their overall health concerns in one place. In her free time, Emmy enjoys spending time with her family, going to the beach, and traveling. Mahalo nui for your patience, Dr. Eno Orikasa. Uh, tell us, please, what is the status on oral health and Native Hawaiians? Mahalo, Kim. Um, first, I want to just acknowledge my co-authors. Um, I wish I wish they could be here to co-present with me, but um, yes, we, you know, it was a lot of work. Um, and not much research available. Um, so we really had to depend um, a lot on um, interviews and just patient experiences um, and firsthand um, knowledge of, um, you know, Native Hawaiians and their oral health. Um, so, you know, a lot of research has been done over the last 30 years since the original Eola Mao report um, that directly link the oral health status to overall well-being. Um, you know, it affects poor oral health affects, affects people not only physically, but also psychologically, you know, not only does it affect their ability to chew to taste, but also to their ability to socialize, you know, if they're concerned about how they look or they speak. Um, we also know that there is a link between periodontitis or gum disease and diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And so we know Native Hawaiians are afflicted and um, they are one of the highest risk populations for cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So we can deduce that they are also at an increased risk for periodontal disease. Um, studies also show that oral health inequity is associated with income, education, race, and ethnicity. Um, also place, you know, whether you reside in an ur urban area or a rural area, and then also disability status. And we know that Native Hawaiians are overrepresented in these risk groups. Um, and this is reflected in their higher rates of decay and emergency visits related to emergency oral health. Um, financial barriers are also one of the primary reasons um, that patients are unable to see a dentist. Um, and so, you know, right now, Medicaid in Hawaii only covers emergency procedures and that is limited to a limited exam. Um, any associated x-rays, any palliative care or extractions, and that is it. Um, there are no restorative benefits or preventive benefits right now. Um, also, uh, Medicare does not include dental care in part A or B right now. Um, it's part of a supplemental package that you have to purchase. Um, so our kupuna are not able to access um, affordable dental care. And there's also a lack of public policy to support access to regular dental care. Um, I need to go back and look at the slides. I might be going ahead, Tersha. Please feel free to just move on if I'm going ahead. <laughs> um, thank you. All right. So there is also a need for a dental workforce that represents our population in order to provide culturally competent care. 
Um, right now, there is a lack of data on Native Hawaiian representation within the workforce. Um, the DCCA, the local dental associations, they do not collect race or ethnicity information. So it was hard to um, find that information to include in this report, but we definitely know that um, Native Hawaiians are underrepresented in the oral health care fields. And this is not, uh, is not limited to uh, the dental professional, like a dentist or a dental hygienist, but also dental assistants or community dental health care workers. Um, there is more than 70 years of research that has consistently shown that flow, optimal levels of fluoride in community water is safe and effective in preventing tooth decay. Um, and then as an alternative, it can also be, be applied topically as an affordable, at an affordable cost, but that usually requires a medical or dental appointment. And we know um, that there are barriers to um, going to these appointments. So community water fluoridation reaches all at a very low cost. All right, thank you. So the gaps, um, there is a lack of funding. Well, I should qualify that. Um, there may be a lack of funding for capital expansion for the Native Hawaiian Health Centers um, and the federally qualified health centers um, to increase access to services. When we talk about what has happened in the last couple of years, I guess, you know, the silver lining of the pandemic may be that funding has increased slightly. Um, federal and, and private grants have increased, and this has allowed some clinics to expand or update their facilities. Place-based care also needs to be expanded. Transportation, the inability to take off of work, um, limited mobility are all barriers that could be addressed by an increase in place-based care. And that includes the sealant-based programs, um, fluoride mouth rinses, or, or school-based sealant programs and fluoride mouth rinse programs that used to uh, take place in the schools. Not during my lifetime, I don't think, I don't recall, but my mom definitely remembers the dental hygienist going into schools and, and, and doing cleanings and sealants and fluoride. The challenge is, another challenge is that these school-based sealant and fluoride programs um, need to expand to more schools, but the funding is lacking. Um, and also med current MedQuest policies and billing systems are not amenable to place-based care. And so we need to, you know, advocate with MedQuest about changing some of these so that our federally qualified health centers can go into the schools and be reimbursed so that the programs are sustainable. Also, Medicaid adult dental benefits, which used to include prevention and treatment, were discontinued in 2009. Um, Medicare also does not offer a dental plan. So although there, there has been progress on this, um, Cong Congress failed to include their medical, the Medicare dental benefit in their Build Back Better legislative package late last year. But it is promising that you know, these discussions are taking place and that legislators are finally beginning to understand and realize that oral health is part of overall health. Um, on the, the good news is that locally, our um, adult Medicaid dental bill that is currently going through the State House and Senate is progressing with uh, no or very limited opposition. I don't want to jinx anything about talking about it, but we are very pleased with that continuing to progress through our legislature right now. And again, you know, just this shows that um, uh, our legislators, the people are realizing that, you know, oral health is part of overall health and viewing it in a holistic manner. All right, next slide, please. There is inadequate funding and programs to increase the number of Native Hawaiian dental professions, um, especially within the Native Hawaiian communities. Um, education costs are soaring. I think right now um, the cost of dental school is running oh, like into the three hundred thousand dollars range. Um, so then you couple that with you know buying a practice when they return home. It's it's just not feasible. And then the cost of living in Hawaii continues to rise. Um, so the challenge is how do we recruit, educate, and retain Native Hawaiians um, to return home to help build a culturally competent workforce. Um, there are also few programs and educational resources to address oral health in terms of Native, in terms of Native Hawaiian health concepts and values. 
Here at Hui no Keolopono, we are very fortunate to have a cultural advisor to consult. We also have Lomi Lomi practitioners um, and healthcare workers um, who have developed relationships within homestead communities um, and other organizations, Native Hawaiian organizations in our community. So we, dental professionals you know, from other backgrounds, are able to learn and engage with others and engage with our community and our patients and relate to them. And historically, looking at Native Hawaiian health before European contact, Native Hawaiians had excellent health. There was a low prevalence of, of caries or decay. And so we need to re or reincorporate Native Hawaiian practices and philosophies. You know, going back to Auntie Claire and um, Leslie's um, presentation about diet, we need to focus on low sugar diets. Um, you know, with the sugar sweetened beverages, we just see uh, an influx of, of caries happening, especially within our teens and our young adults. And then we also need to focus more on prevention and education. So a lot of, you know, the Native Hawaiian families, it is the parents instilling values of oral health in their children. And then the children will then in turn help the kupuna um, achieve good oral health. So, you know, really educating the whole family and not, um, you know, just focusing on the fill and drill, drill and fill. Um, water fluoridation, going back to that, oh, sorry, you can go back to that, Tersha, thank you. Water fluoridation, again, is proven to be cost-effective and reaches many, uh, but it has not been implemented. And whenever legislation has been introduced, it's quickly squashed because the concept is so controversial. Um, so I think, you know, we need to kind of shift our, our focus, um, you know, just promote fluoridation um, and just take it out into the community um, and, and do it in a topical manner. Also, there is a lack of data across the lifespan, especially clinical data information specific to Native Hawaiians. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of state and ins uh, the state and insurance companies don't collect demographics. So it's really hard to capture this data and analyze it um, and then, you know, pull it all together and, and present, um, which was a, a big challenge when we were compiling this Eola Maua Maua report. All right, next slide, please, Tersha. So some effective and promising approaches, which I touched upon a little bit already, but we'll review again. Um, we have been fortunate to have comprehensive dental services provided by our federally qualified health systems and our Native Hawaiian health centers. Um, this allows providers to focus on healthcare outcomes rather than having to worry about the financial pressures that often burden the um, private sector. So we're able to spend more time to strengthen the provider patient relationship um, and really, you know, see an improvement in some of these um, uh, communities that may be resistant to uh, seeking oral health care. Um, we are able to provide a holistic approach to care. Um, as mentioned in my bio, that's why I love working at the Hui. Um, you know, patients feel more comfortable obtaining care when it's all in one place where it's where, um, you know, they don't have to go from physician to physician to dentist to um, physical therapy, you know, everything, every, everything is in one place and convenient for them. And so they really, we, you know, we really are able to develop this relationship where they trust us um, and want to come and see us. Also, place-based care brings dental services to where children and adults go to school or where they reside. It's convenient for them. Um, so school-based programs um, that provide sealants, fluoride, and even comprehensive care are currently in our communities. Um, virtual dental homes um, is another concept um, that is effective and a promising, and we hope to see it expand um, statewide. And so that's, again, taking the services to where the, the patients are. Um, right now, there are, or this is occurring with WIC, with Early Head Start and Head Start, and also long-term care facilities. So again, reaching all, all ends of the spectrum. Dental case management um, helps to promote oral health for children and adults needing specialized care. 
And so uh, here at the Hui, we've had a partnership with the Hawaii Keiki program and their nurses. And this has helped to ensure follow up care for children that are screened within the sealant program. Um, and it just kind of provides some some hand holding to make sure that they get to the dentist so that their children are getting follow up care um, that they need. This also helps to na uh, patients navigate through the referral process. So if patients need to are seen at a dental office and then they need to go see a specialist, um, once again, you know, a lot of times they might be a little bit resistant going to another office. So here um, at community centers, you know, we're able to take that time out to schedule appointments for patients to um, follow up with them and call them and remind them, hey, you need to go to your appointment tomorrow, even to provide transportation to their appointments. And then referring patients for comprehensive medical care or traditional healing. So a lot of times, um, you know, dentist or patients may see their dentist, not a lot of times, but sometimes patients will go to their dentist every six months regularly, and they only go to their doctor when there's a problem. And so the dentist may be able to, you know, to, to screen for these chronic health issues and find them earlier. Um, and sooner and help to refer them to the other um, to receive other care. Sorry, one more, Tersha. <laughs> also, finally, we need to improve data collection um, or in the efforts to improve data collection. Um, we are working on community surveys on oral health care and perceptions of oral health. And then we are advocate, we need to advocate for segregated race and ethnicity within um, state systems, within insurance systems, so that um, you know, interested organizations are, are able to ease, more easily pull this data. All right, just to recap, because I um, kind of went over all this already. So the recommendations for in impact, we wanna address oral health in connection with overall health. Don't separate the two. It's important that we, you know, you don't say, um, I don't know, you, you're, you're not cutting off a part of the foot. This is what I heard from someone else. You know, we don't, you don't think of your foot any different than you would um, the rest of your body. So why are we disting or distinguishing or separating the mouth from the rest of the body? So we need to start viewing it holistically and as one. We need to increase oral health literacy and awareness. We need to develop a diversified oral health workforce, invest in prevention, increase access to care to decrease oral health disparities. So think of place-based care, more place-based care programs, implement culturally adapted programs and practices, and then improve data collection relevant to native Hawaiian health. It's on the next slide, Tricia. Thank you. So collect data on native Hawaiian representation in the dental workforce to improve data collected across the lifespan to analyze the data, to improve oral health programs, and then finally to establish policies to ensure that there's open and responsible data sharing statewide and nationwide. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Eno Orikasa. Um, I would like to bring up uh, the other two panelists as well, Dr. Hughes and Dr. Leslie. So we have all of our panelists up and maybe we can um, take, the, um, take the presentation off the screen as well. While we are bringing them into the screen, I just want to say that, um, you know, the original Aola Mao report in 1985 had, uh, there was one report called Nutrition and Dental Health, and it was all together as one. And many of the findings were the same. Many of the recommendations for impact were the same as they are now, a little bit more refined, a little bit more up to date, a little bit more sophisticated. But as you've pointed out, Dr. Dr. Eno Orikasa, there really is a close relationship between nutrition and oral health, the intake of sugar, the uh, intake of healthy foods versus uh, non-healthy foods, and then the impact of your uh, your oral health on the rest of the healthy body. So there really is a close relationship. And um, I open up the floor now for a few minutes to questions to any of our panelists. Uh, Amber has uh, talked about 
uh, fluoridation of water. Military bases are also no longer fluoridating their water. I didn't know that. You know, for many, many years, most of my lifetime, the military bases here in Hawaii do fluoridate. Outside, there our water source is not fluoridated. The question is, why is it so controversial if dentists know it's an effective means to reducing poor oral health? At what point in the water system is fluoride added? Um, I know a little bit about that politics, but maybe Dr. Eno Orikasa, you can help to answer that for us. Exactly. It is, you know, it is politics um, in part, but there's also a lot, you know, with the, the internet is wonderful, but it's also, um, a way to spread misinformation, an easy way to spread misinformation, um, and it travels very quickly. Um, and so, you know, like any fluoride occurs naturally in waters. And so there's a lot of studies out there um, that link over the, you know, fluorosis or that show, you know, that talk about fluorosis, and that's just really high levels of fluoride. And um, you know, there are some, some studies that show that really high levels of fluoride can affect co cognitive abilities and then also the strength of teeth. Um, and so in some communities where water is uh, naturally fluoridated, they have to remove some fluoride in order to get it at the optimal levels. Um, but, you know, the information is out there and people will choose to, to believe, you know, what they want sometimes not understanding or, you know, really, um, going in depth in terms of analyzing the studies. And so, you know, they see, they see the headline and then, you know, that's all that they look at. And then they spread that to someone else and someone else. And so that's one part um, of, I think the fear. And then the other, the other aspect, it is cultural. So, you know, here in Hawaii, we would be adding something to our waters and um, not everyone wants to do that. Um, it's not natural. Um, and so, even within our native Hawaiian community, there's a big pushback um, against that because the, you know we are adding something to the waters that it's not pure in their minds. And so um, you know I, we understand that. Um, and I think that's why I think at this point it might be more worthwhile to shift our focus away from community fluoridation, not that we don't believe in it. Um, but our efforts are, are really better spent at the topical approach. You know, we don't have to argue with, with parents or, or people about the systemic effects because we're applying it topically. And really the benefits are, are similar at a certain age. You know, once the teeth have already developed within the jaw, it's not the systemic effects are, are, are as valuable. And so we can approach it in a top, you know, just in a topical manner. And so I think um, that's, Kind of where we're shifting in the public health arena is, is is working on educating patients first about the benefits of fluoride, reassuring them that it is not going to be systemically applied um, or taken, and it's just a topical effect, so that alleviates some of their fears, um, and then they're still getting the benefits. So you know, again, going going back to the education, I think the education part of it is so important. Wow, appreciate that new, uh, truly promising approach because it's it's a fairly new public health approach. I moved by uh, both presentations how much emphasis there was on developing an appropriate workforce. And I wonder if I could just look in the area of nutrition and dietetics for, um, for a moment there. I was, you know, being involved with Papa Lulukahi's involvement with the Native Hawaiian Health Scholarship Program. We actually take pride, we can count the number of Hawaiian dietitians and nutritionists on our hands, right? So we're always encouraged to, uh, you know, let's get some more dietitians, let's get some more nutritionists, but it really is uh, a challenge if, if, you're not employable, right? If you're if there aren't jobs that are funded that are open and available to you. And so I was really interested in your recommendation to let's how about and were you saying this actually, Dr. Leslie, should we more doctors and nurses need more training in nutrition? Um, Is that what you were implying? Um, well, yes, uh, because that's what is is available in the new violent communities. It's not that they would be the best, sir, you know, the best people, I guess you could say. I'm not saying they're not, but you know, it, it, that's, that's also available because there, there really isn't, there really isn't 
positions available on the neighbor islands for, for dietitians. The ones that are available are in hospitals, but the ones in hospitals are inaccessible to the community. The community they don't go out and do community um, you know, classes. They don't, they're not available for, for, for counseling. Um, and in fact, I know uh, our local hospital, if there are community members who are interested, they charge them per hour to come in if they want to talk to one of their hospital dietitians. And so um, just because of that lack of, of positions available, you know, it, it's, it's hard to, to empl employ more dietitians, but because there, you know, there's always doctors, there's always nurses, there's always medical assistants. And you know, then, then that would be another route in which we can get the community more educated in nutrition. And then I think, you know, doctors in general just could stand to get more nutrition <laughs> education. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I don't see a lot more questions and I appreciate everybody who's still with us. I wonder if um, Dr. Hughes and, you know, or, or Auntie Claire to so many these days, not in my day, we never called you Auntie, but <laughs> but Auntie Claire to so many of us these days, I wonder if you can give us a little bit of historical perspective back when dental health and uh, nutrition were together and how the Department of Health and, you know, the public health arena in Hawaii kind of paired these two specialties together for the benefit of public health. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what you see, uh, what you see happening today, either in terms of the needs or, or the wise, wise practices that are occurring? Oh, I am going to unmute you. Sorry, sorry. Um, I have to keep it muted. Otherwise, I'm going to be convincing all the way along. So, but the uh, Department of Health did have two branches. Actually, dental was a division. Nutrition was always a branch. But they did work closely together because Dr. Um, uh, what was his name now? I, I had it. Mark Greer. Mark Greer. Oh, no, Mark came to assist him. But there, uh, there was um, forerunner, Cal, Manny Cal, Manuel Cal, K A U. He was there for a very long time and he liked to do research. So you can find some of his uh, research, will tell you what happens with. Um, the change from a rice diet to, or from a poi diet to a rice diet. It's that rice turns to acid in the mouth and you have, after you eat it, there's acid. With poi, it turns alkaline. So there's no uh, attack on the teeth that acid leaves. But anyway, Manny Kao uh, researched uh, school children a lot. And he wrote, oh, volumes on it. So when we were writing the Native Hawaiian Healthcare Act and no doctors took, no dentist stood uh, up to write the chapter, I wrote it. I went back to the office and pulled out all these reports. And I thought, okay, okay, Claire, you gotta do this or we're not gonna have dental health. And I, you know, put in a paper like you do at a, a senior study on, in, uh, in health somewhere. And um, I sent it to Manny Kao to read. And of course, I had his long list of articles that I read. And so um, I sent it on a routing slip. It was very official. I sent it on a routing slip from our department to his department. And he initialed it as received, as received and read. And also in the uh, article, he found one, one typo. You know, in those days, we didn't have computers. It was typing. So we had to type everything. So I made a uh, transposed uh, the, and instead of T-H-E, it was T-E-H. And so he circled it with the same pen that he signed it with. It was an ink pen, same color ink. And, and then he sent it on to Mark who reviewed it and didn't make any comments and I got it back. So I went to Kikuri and I said, this is a approved copy. <laughs> and we put that in as the report. And I think that's why in one place you see it together, but it's, it was always a separate report that I know the very first time we submitted 
uh, the, the reports separately so that it would get funding. And it did receive funding. Our Native Hawaiian Health Care Act has funding for dental care. And, um, and it's sorely needed. And it's well used by people on our island, well used. And as adults, there were, when we did our research around the islands, there was plenty of evidence that Hawaiians, elder Hawaiians were really troubled with no teeth. We had one man who was over six feet, who was, used to be a robust 220 pounds or something. And he was just a skinny guy. We asked him, what happened? Kikuni asked him, what happened? And he said, oh, he, I want to eat soup. Why? He said, the two teeth are above and below each other. So he cannot chew when he had two teeth on his side. So he said, can I chew? So can't even gum. So he had to eat soup. And with soup, you know, it's always so watery and much less nutrition in it because of course, no one was there to help the old man put some more vegetables and some more rice in it. He was cooking for himself. So he lost all that weight and was he looked emaciated. But, um, Dental care is so very important. I've had friends also who have passed because they were so terrified of dentists that they, um, their teeth just rotted and um, the decay caused um, infections. And so they passed away because of it. So there's a whole bunch of issues. And um, I think we need to be more individualistic when we work with them. And of course, there's no time for that. People are so rushed to get the maximum people through and in the least amount of time and with least amount of handling that it doesn't um, allow for the personal touch. But I think that um, with the ancillary personnel in a doctor's office or a dentist's office, maybe not even the, um, the uh, trained help but maybe the lady at the front desk you can always say oh you know my teeth this or that and they get it to the doctor so complaining a little bit not a lot because she's got work to do up on the desk might work too so I like the idea of using others to to kind of help get the message across for all care even nutrition and dental care we're not a major provider yeah so right of care. So yes, we need to have help. I agree. And thank you in particular for that historic um, context. I can think of tons more questions, but we've gone over time already. And I hope that maybe we can talk to each of you individually in the future. I'd like to mahalo all of our panelists, Dr. Emmy Eno Orikasa, Dr. Claire Hughes, Dr. Jody Leslie, mahalo Nui for participating. Most of all, mahalo for participating in the Aola Mao study to begin with, and then coming back to present the findings and the recommendations. That's really important because this is going to be updated again and again and again. To all the attendees, mahalo for staying with us. Uh, there will be an evaluation that goes to you uh, as soon as you close out the meeting, and then we will be coming back to you with the summary of recommendations. Mahalo, Momi's putting those in. So panelists, mahalo. To all of our cross post partners on Facebook, the five Native Hawaiian healthcare systems, the Native Hawaiian Center of Excellence at the Medical School, Ahahui Onakauka, Next Gen, and um, uh, Ekolu Meanui, mahalo for sharing this presentation on your platforms. Mahalo to the back of the house, uh, to Momi, to Keave, to Kalai, to Tersha, uh, who serves as the Kahu for the Eola Mau Amau. Uh, reports. Mahalo nui to all of you. And uh, you can see on the slide right there that the sixth presentation, the sixth report back to the community is next Wednesday at 12 noon. We will be featuring two reports, the health workforce report and the data governance report. So again, mahalo nui to all of you for tuning in. Papa Ola Lokahi is pleased to be able to report back to you finally at, you know, after two years of being closed up with the pandemic and there's only more work to be done. Uh, and we're grateful to all of you. Aloha, mahalo for attending this afternoon. And aola mau. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. Thank you.
Thanks, Claire, Emmy, Jody. We're so happy to have you. I'm so sorry I, I got all excited. I think I don't know what happened. I couldn't get in. <laughs> that's there's okay, also Auntie so Claire. Much, and there's so much good research that's you know that's out there too. Uh, I know that. Uh, well, it looks like she has hung up, but Doctor, mm -hmm. um, you know, Kainoa Filkowski, she's got all of the first foods research projects going on, and I know she's interviewed me. You know, she's interviewing Kupuna, she's interviewing mothers, she's interviewing mothers who breastfeed. So there is some new research that's. Um, coming up and out that I, I, I think definitely has value. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult. I know that Manny Cow had a, uh, 